Hey there, it's Raimu. This is part five of my introduction to Rust series, taking it one step at a time. So in this video, we're going to cover control flow. Let's get started. Let's go back up directory and do cargo new part five. And then open that. Control flow is all about making decisions based on values. So like many introductions to programming that you might find, I'm going to pick on Fibonacci numbers as a way of introducing control flow. So Fibonacci numbers are a sequence of numbers in math that start at 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8. You can see the significance of them are mathematical. So if you take two squares of size 1 and you draw a square bordering them, it's of size 2. And then if you take the square bordering that, that's size 3. Take the square bordering that, that's size 5, and etc. So let's go about writing some code in Rust that will compute this sequence of numbers. And let's make it into a function. Let's say that we want to get the 42nd Fibonacci number. So let n equal 42. And then in this print, we'll say f of something equals something, and that first number will be n. Second will be the result returned by a function called fib, passing in the argument n. As we covered in the last video, you can have functions in Rust that take arguments and return results. So, glancing back at the definition from Wikipedia, we can see the first two numbers are given to us. All the other numbers are based off of the previous numbers added together. So to translate that into Rust, I need to introduce a new concept, which is the if-else statements. It works like in a natural language. We would say something like if n is 0, return 0. Else, if n equal 1, return 1. Else, and this is where it gets really interesting, return Fibonacci of n minus 2 plus Fibonacci of n minus 1. Just like it's said to do in Wikipedia. Although I did get it backwards. They had one and then two. Doesn't really matter. So, what's interesting about this is that the function is calling itself. This is a form called recursion. Now we can see by running this that it takes a little bit of time. But eventually we get the right answer. Now you could probably figure out what if and else do here. This is a basic form of control flow. So as the program is executing this function fib, it will decide whether or not to execute this block of instructions, or this block, or this block, based on evaluating the expressions on the other side of the ifs. So if n is 0, it goes into this block and returns 0. If n is 1, it goes into this block and returns 1. Otherwise, it goes into this block, calls itself two more times, adds the two results, and then returns that. So if n was 2, it would be returning Fibonacci of 1 plus Fibonacci of 0, which go into these two blocks respectively. So we get 1 plus 0 is 1. Now let's take a moment to explore these warnings that we get. Russ is telling us we don't actually need a return statement. For returning values out of functions when it's the last statement in the block, we don't need the return. And we don't need the semicolon. Okay, now how can we go about making this Fibonacci function a bit faster? As you saw when I ran it, it took quite a bit of time. Mostly because when we call Fibonacci twice, this is going to double the number of calls all the way through the sequence. So it's going to be calling Fibonacci millions of times. When in actuality, we really only needed to compute 42 Fibonacci numbers, the sequence up to the 42nd one. So approaching this a little bit differently, instead of using recursion, why don't we start out at the other end of the sequence at 0 and walk through the sequence until we get to 42? So if n is the number that we're going to, in this case 42, Let's have another variable start out at 0 and walk forwards until we, it gets to n. So let's say something like let x equals 0. And then here's where we're, going to, where we're going to introduce the while loop, while x is less than n. And then we're going to have a block here. Now going back to the definition of Fibonacci, we know that the first two numbers are given to us. So let's start out with those first two numbers. Let them be called a and b. a is 0, and b is 1. Since we're given the first two numbers, then x is really going to start at 2 because we only really need to compute more numbers past the first two. Which means I should probably have put this into the if, which is fine, we can do it right now. Remove that. And then when we get to the end of this loop, 
we're going to end up returning b. And it looks like I'm off by one because if we passed in n of two, we would want this loop to at least execute once. And each time through the loop, we're going to be incrementing x until it reaches the value of n. So we're going to have something like x equals x plus one. And then looking at the Fibonacci equation again, each time through this loop, we're going to say that the next number is the sum of the previous two numbers. So let the next equal the previous two added together. And then to walk through the sequence one step, we're going to move those values through. So A becomes the old value of B, B becomes the new next. Unfortunately, we have some errors to deal with, which require that I introduce another concept in Rust. If we hover over this error, it says can't assign twice to immutable variable A, and the word immutable is key here. And it says there in the recommendation, consider making this a binding mutable with M-U-T-A. So let's do that and I'll explain what we're doing here. In fact, we'll do it for both A and B and X. And we can see the errors go away. So what this M-U-T keyword in front of a binding variable means is that we're allowed to change the value of that variable. It can change at any time after it's declared, as opposed to immutable variables, which you can only set the value once. In other languages, an immutable variable is sometimes called a constant. So let's make sure I got the program correct. If we run it again, we should get the same result but much faster this time. So let's go through a few of these warnings so we can clean that up and learn a little bit more about Rust. X equals X plus one. We see that Rust says, hmm, manual implementation of an assignment operation. Replace it with X plus equals one. Cool. So if we know that we're just going to take a value and then put it through an expression like plus one and then assign it back, we can collapse that down a bit. X plus equal one. Great. This last warning is that I forgot again that we can just say B at the end. This will happen a lot if you're coming from a language like C, C++, where you're obligated to say return and then the value and then semicolon. In Rust, if it's, again, the last statement in a block and that block becomes the output of the function, you can just say the expression without any return. So you can do quite a bit with just if, else, and while. But let's explore a few more things in control flow in Rust. So one alternative to saying while x is less than n is just to say loop. And at the end, we can say if x is greater than or equal to n, break. And we should get the same results. Yet another way we could say this is if x is less than n, continue, and then if it's not less than n, break here. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to make these kinds of uses of continue and break, but they're simple here to illustrate what they do. Break essentially breaks out of a loop. A loop is an unconditional looping of code, so it continues to go forever unless you break. Continue basically goes to the top of the loop immediately. Another thing is that break does have the capability of carrying a value, so we could take this B here and actually move it here at the break, and it works just the same as if we did a break and returned B. Essentially, what this does is it says when we break out of the loop, b becomes the value of this overall loop expression, which since it's the last expression of the function, becomes the return value of the function. To illustrate this further, we could bind the result of that loop to another variable, let's say answer, and if we wanted to, we could print that. Answer is answer, and we'll need a semicolon at the end, and a trailing answer because with the let equals, it becomes a statement. Statements need to end in a semicolon in general, unless they're the last expression, which in case it's not because we wanted to print something, the last expression is the answer we want to return. Again, we could have said return answer, but in Rust, it's easier to just abbreviate it as answer. So now we had the opportunity to say what the answer was before the function returned. So that's a quick run through of control flow in Rust. There's quite a lot you can do with if, else, loop and while, break and continue. We're going to see those a lot more in the future videos. In the next video, we're going to take on what I think is one of the first really big challenges in learning Rust in general, which is the concept of ownership and borrowing. And we'll also introduce a little bit of object-oriented programming. So I hope you'll stick with the series. I hope you enjoyed this video. See you next time.